Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zingo Show, episode number 175, with me, your host, Agostino Zinga. How you doing? How you feeling, motherfuckers? Hope you guys are well, rested, hydrated, lubricated, limbered, and all that malarkey. I am your host, this lovely, groggy, musty, moggy, windy, wet, 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 wet Tuesday morning. And I hope you guys are having a great time. I know I am. So let's get into it, man. Um, How you guys feeling? You guys are good? Yeah, hope you guys are good. All right. Um, right. I'm feeling great, man, as per usual. I've had a pretty solid weekend. Um, I've had a pretty solid week. Um, yesterday wasn't a, a really solid week, but it was a happy week because I ended up going to hospital or GP, or whatever, to get a little checkup on a little um, medical issue that I was having, and I was given you all clear, which is great. Um, the only bad thing about going to hospital on a Monday morning is that essentially, you know, you have your appointment at eleven o'clock. It takes you about an hour and a half to get there, but then you only get seen until one p.m. Right, which is always annoying. And I've tried to like um. I've just, I've just wonder, you know, we wonder out loud these kind of things. Like, why is it that whenever you book an appointment at a GP for a specific time, you never get seen at the time you're meant to be at? But then, if you missed your allotted time, um, schedule your time slot, let's say, because sometimes, you know, for instance, my appointment was at eleven. Usually, some GPs or hospitals will give you like a half an hour buffer, right? They'll say like, oh, if you have to be, you have to be in and around the area within, you know, from eleven to half, half eleven. But let's say you missed that, right? All of a sudden, your space is gone. You have to rebook another appointment for another day. But they can have you sitting around for hours on end. It just doesn't make any sense. The only way I can kind of rationalize it is that because it's a GP and a, and a doctor's, you know, a hospital, whatever it may be called, they're having to deal with individual patients. So, you know, they can never, they will never know um, how long they're going to be with a patient um, until the patient comes into the room, right? They have no idea. So sometimes someone might come in a room and they might just have like a, on paper might look like a, a really basic ailment. But then whilst they get talking, they might realize, oh shit, actually this person needs, you know, more ex- extra help, whatever it may be. So I think for the most part, um, it generally is based on that. But it is quite annoying, I have to admit, it is very annoying. And, you know, sometimes doctors, there's no, um, there's no way to kind of judge when it's going to be busy. No way to kind of know oh, it's going to be a fucked up day for me. But by and large, you know, I think going going to the hospital on a Monday morning is probably not the best time to go to it because it was absolutely ram jammer. And because it's half term and all these kids are not in school, there was like, I don't know, I swear to God, there must have been seven kids in that reception with broken limbs. Like with some a broken leg, a broken ankle, like fractures, something, something to do with their, their bones shattering. And it's like, fuck, man. I'm so lucky, I'm so fortunate that I haven't broken any bones and it hasn't been through any kind of, um, it hasn't been through any kind of, um, it hasn't been for any kind of, you know, goodness or, you know, observation or careful or being, you know, being careful on my part. It's just, just plain luck. I'm not someone that really, you know, I'm not, um, the most, um, careful person or I'm not the most, I'm quite heavy handed in that regard. I'm a bit reckless sometimes. And I have no idea, honestly, I have no idea why I haven't broken a limb. No idea. The most that's happened to me is I've maybe sprained a muscle. I've maybe stretched a muscle. I've maybe pulled it. I've maybe torn a ligament or two, you know, just due to like, you know, playing football and just running around. Maybe my jogging days when I used to jog a lot back in the day. Like I used to jog like five days a week or whatever, six days a week, like five, four, five, three or four, three miles plus a day. Sometimes just due to like, you know, just taking a beating out of your limbs and your muscles and shit, you end up kind of tearing ligaments and stuff like that. But then, you know, after a week or so, you are back to, you're back to running um, fitness again. But I've been lucky. I've never been actually broken my bones. I remember the last time that happened to my family, my little brother actually broke his arm, which was, you know, quite hilarious because he was trying to do a, a particular skill. When we were playing around in a in a little concrete um enclave thing, little square. He tried to I think he tried to do a crave turn or something like that and he stacked it and he broke his thing, innit? Which is you know which kind of makes you laugh because you know, breaking your limbs because you have to do a football skill is funny because it's in the same sort of category as um that P. Diddy thing, um, don't copy me because you might hurt yourself, right? The dance thing. Like, you know, it's like trying to dance and, you know, and show off your moves and, you know, let yourself go and then you end up kind of, you know, slipping on a fucking, you know, on on, on a puddle of, of Covarcier and you end up kind of, you know, smashing your head on bouncing it off the dance floor and you end up with a fraction of the back of your skull. That's quite funny. 
Uh, maybe it's just me, right? And again, oh my god, that's not funny, man. Someone touched your head on the floor. Look, it's funny. You're trying to do a moonwalk and you break your leg like that. That's funny to me. Um, but yeah, I've been lucky in that regard. But yeah, hospital's full of kids. I had to wait an hour and a half or two hours more until my appointment was done. But you know, by and large, everything got sorted. Here I am. I'm gonna move this camera a little bit closer to me because you know it's good to get closer. It's good to get up, up front and personal. But yeah, um, I was there. Had to wait ages to get seen. I didn't get seen when I wanted to get seen. But then when I got seen, um, the results were good. And here I am. Um, what I've been up to this weekend. Weekend has been pretty good, pretty solid. Probably one of my most funnest weekend I've had in a while. Because it kind of combined, you know, going out with a friend. It kind of combined going to see my favorite artist. It combined going out to see a live gig. It combined going to a place I don't usually go to normally. It also combined having a DJ set to kind of like, you know, um, put a little bookend on the night. Um, in the Heath Cotton store. So essentially, um, I went to go see Drake for the assassination vacation tour at the O2 in Greenwich, um, and um, it was a fun night. One of my um, one of my probably favorite gigs I've been to in a while. Not because of the intimacy, not because of any of that sort of stuff, but just because the fact that Drake is like, you know one of the biggest stars out there right now, let alone in hip hop, just in music um, overall. And I think it's probably the first time, maybe outside of a metal gig, outside of maybe seeing Iron Maiden, maybe seeing Slipknot, all those kind of people. It's probably the first time I've gone to see like a really big, like um, top tier artist play um, somewhere. And there is always something a little bit different about those kind of sets because, you know, by and large, they have loads of openers. By and large, the intermissions are really long. By and large, their sets are usually quite long. Um, by and large, I can sometimes feel a bit disconnected because they're, they're dancing all the way up uh, up over there whatever it may be called but this set was probably one of the funnest ones because i think drake has really achieved something quite incredible with the you know maybe with the set design with the fact that you know it's one big massive rectangular platform that has um a sort of i think it's a screen on it that kind of projects um certain images that flow that you know um, hover above the air whether it's a car whether it's these little tiny robot things um, he's created a stage that basically allows him to perform on that entire rectangular stage by himself with no one else on the stage apart from a few dancers that come out here and there and still kill it. And I think it's a skill that, um, I think it's something that he's been able to add to his repertoire that a lot, a lot of people are, are probably haven't done before and something I'm sure people are going to be doing later in the, in the future going forward. I think maybe the only thing I've seen similar to it was maybe Kanye West performances um, when he was doing the... Um, What's the one we did with the with the mountain? He had a mask on. That was quite good and very theatrical. And it was mostly him on his own on an NPC machine. There was a few kind of dancers and choreographers that come out towards the end. He did it as well, kind of the same sort of way when he was performing with Kid Cudi for the Kids See Ghost thing um, during the Golf Wang tour. And there's been a few more. Maybe Jay Z's done it a few times, but it's obviously quite a hard thing to do to be on a stage on your own perform especially when it comes to rap and be able to kind of, you know, smash it. And he actually smashed it to smithereens. But before we go to the Drake performances, let's ring it back a bit. We went there. We got there about 7 p.m. Um, by and large, I tried to get there a bit earlier because my friend had to buy some merch. So we went there about 7. Um, as we rocked up to the venue, uh, as we rocked up in just on the Jubilee Line alone, you could tell, you know, you could feel the electricity in, electricity in the air, right? Just heading to the O2. And I think that's what basically separates the top tier artists, right? I think. For the most part, I think when I've gone to see like someone at like Coco, I've gone to see someone at like, um, Oto Academy, you know, by and large, you probably might feel the energy and the vibe by the time you get to the queue, but you could feel the electricity in the air, you could feel the sense of anticipation just from being at Stratford Station alone, right? People are gearing up to go see this um, big star, Drake, someone that everyone's followed from the onset. I think maybe with Drake, the thing that's maybe special of him is the fact that we've kind of seen his ascendancy, right? We've seen his trajectory from the ground up. We've, we've subscribed to him when he was on mixtapes. We've seen all that stuff. We've seen the Lil Wayne Co sign. We've seen the cash money thing. We've seen the OVO thing. Uh, we've seen the kind of direction that he's kind of floated up on and we've kind of been part of the journey. And along the way, he's kind of provided us with soundtracks that have kind of been, um, um, you know, that have kind of provided the soundtracks to our lives or to moments of our lives that are very important, especially for me anyway, going through that kind of, you know, 17 to 25 sort of age age range, you know, that's really important, the kind of music you listen to. So we go and train, you can feel the hype, everyone's kind of excited to see the show. We go out and we get out at the O2 Academy, like, I mean, the O2 Greenwich, he loads of people there, ready to have a good time. 
um immediately as i'm coming out of the o2 i kind of think maybe i might have overdressed not because i was dressed smart but because i just had loads of layers on i had like a bomber jacket and a hoodie i had like big combat trousers on as well i had my balenciaga triple s's which are not the most comfortable shoes to wear during a gig less said about that the better but um as soon as i come out of station i had a feeling that oh i think i did a bit of a oopsie on that one right in terms of the outfits because when i come out of station yes they were the you know the usual girls you'd see under the age of 21 not really wearing much, you know, um, little t-shirts, little crop tops, not having you no know, jackets because I don't want to go to the cloakroom. That was there. But again, I think when you're that age, you're the way you're the way you the way you experience cold isn't the same as um old folks like me, right? You, you can probably handle um not wearing much going out, you know, having a good time and you're fine, right? But I think for olders like me, you're just kind of like, you know, always cold, always mindful about how you're gonna feel when you come back home. So and immediately I saw him, I was like, you know what, fuck it, I'm not going to compare myself to some 16, to some 17, 18-year-old girl, right? Then I see a couple of dudes, right, who look kind of look, maybe like they're not, you know, as young as those girls, but still, you know, not as young, not as old as I am, wearing nothing as well, just wearing a t-shirt with some jeans on or a long-sleeve top. And I was like, oh, fuck. Damn it, damn it, damn it, I fucked up. Because then I remembered that, because I think in my head I had the idea that we had seat, we had seats, right? We didn't. We were on the standing, we were, we were on standing room, we were in the... Um, we're in the standing section, like, the, the, you know, just around the rectangular thing. So I was like, because I thought if we had seats, at least I can stuff my jacket underneath my chair as I was standing up watching a show. But that wasn't true. And then oh, then we finally get there and we're going to stand around to go get so much from my friend. And I'm already feeling cold and I've already got a hoodie and a jacket. And I'm like, oh, shit, it's not going to be a good night. Then we see the merch. The merch is quite nice. Um, It's a bit expensive for what I'm used to, probably because I'm used to going to metal shows and punk shows and the merch is quite cheap. But £35 for a t-shirt, screen printed, not really my thing. But that being said, the designs of the t-shirts were fucking awesome. i got to be honest. The designs were really, really nice. Um, He really did went above and beyond. I think he got my friend, um, not my friend, but someone that I know. I hate people say my friend because he's not really my friend, right? Um, I haven't spoken to him in years. And, you know, I don't know his mum's name. He doesn't know my mum's name. You know, he's not my friend. But some dude that I know or I've, been, or I've known from back in the day in forum times, um, Ian Coops, you might know him, but his name is Julian. Um, he's designer of Stray Rats. And he designed um, most of the Assassinations Tour merch. I'm going to say I'm gonna say Creative Direction in general, but I'm not too sure. But I know that he did the merch. I remember him tweeting about it a while back. Um, so he designed some of the merch. And they had some really cool merch. They had like a neon a neon t a neon green t-shirt that looked fucking awesome a white t-shirt they had like a navy blue hoodie a black hoodie and a couple of long sleeves and most of the stuff had sold out i think in the bigger size i think a lot of people went to go, i went i think a lot of people just got larger than xl just because you know they're easy to wear loads of mediums were left and smalls and shit that was cool um but by and large yeah the merch was quite nice the queue was massive to get the merch they had loads of little places to get it but that was quite good as well they had like a massive they had like a big little um port cabin place to get it where you can queue up and go get it there then as you're approaching the front of the o2 um now named the o3 in honor of drake they had another little section you can buy merch that was kind of in that was kind of um on the side of the building sort of like a little hole you could buy merch from there and then i think inside there was another place to buy merch as well no, no problem, no, no problem, no hassle. Waited about half an hour to get the merch, about half an hour, thirty-five minutes to get it. After we got it, we queued up to go get uh, to go, kind of enter the arena. Then as we entered the arena, um, we think we found out that supposed to be, because my friend had an O, my friend was on O two, we could supposed to be going to the blue room, which is a little sort of like um VIP ish kind of um O two priority members room that you could go into, have a drink. There was a free cloak room. Um, you could access to easy access to the toilet that's inside the arena. Loads of comfy chairs. Just in general, just a fucking cool little spot that I didn't know existed. Only if you're an O2 customer, which was fucking awesome, right? So we queue up, we go in there. We, you know, again, you find a cloakroom that's free. So I end up putting my jacket in there. I leave my hoodie with me just in case I need it, which I probably shouldn't have left with me because I was sweating. It. I was fucking sweating it out and it made it stink like fuck. But hey, ho, what can you do? We hung in there for a bit, and then that's came. That that's when the real surprise started, right? We hang in there. And the surprise started in terms of the prices of the fucking drinks. <laughs> oh fuck! I ended up getting a couple of James, a couple of double Jamesons um, on the rocks of my for me, and my friend, um, and I paid twenty six pound, I think, or twenty six or twenty four pound. I was like, oh my god, twenty four pound for double two double Jamesons, uh, uh, like neat, nothing else. It's like wow, wow. And again, you forget how expensive these things are. I guess. In general, that's how they make their money back, I guess. Um, in terms of the 
the cost, but I don't think that's true because the retail price of those tickets was like a hundred and twenty pound or something, right? I think even seats were really expensive. I don't think you could get a seat cheaper than that. So it wasn't the most cheapest concert in the world. So it's like hundred and something pounds to pay for. I think resellers were shutting their tickets for about seventy to one forty. Then you go inside there, and you know most they don't really have a cloakroom that you can pay for. I don't think. I think the only cloakroom is that kind of O2 sort of like um, a blue room place. Then the drinks are fucking twenty four quid. It's like whoa, insane. The, um, the only good thing they did, or one of the good things to help help it out, is like um, most places, especially those places, they don't let you bring in bottled drinks. You can bring in a bottle, but you're not allowed to bring in a lid. I'm assuming because they don't want you to chuck it on the stage. The only good thing they did, did do, oh, that this copy is giving me fucking uh, burn. The only good thing that they did do was that they allowed you to bring your bottles of water in, but you could uh, you could get it filled up for free behind the bar. They can put some water in for you. So that was quite cool, right? And most of the water was quite cold and shit. Um, if your bottle's big enough, they can actually chuck in some crushed ice there for you too. So that makes things a bit more manageable. But imagine paying 24 quid for two Jameson, two double Jamesons. Like, insane. But anyway... I guess in those kind of places, you're not really looking to get smashed anyway, right? It's a gig. You want to have fun and have a bit of drink. We hang in there. We have a good time. We're chilling. Um, when we walk in, uh, Back and Not Nice is playing. He's kind of going through the last three songs or so. And again, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of Back and Not Nice. Don't get me wrong. But I think it's g- nice, no pun intended, to see him on such a big of a stage. To see Drake kind of really bringing him up. And really kind of giving the opportunity to kind of, you know, practice and play in front of such a big crowd. I think it's something that's not something that you can take for granted. After that, Tory Lanez came on um, for a little bit. Intermissions in between, I think about of like, let's say 20 to 30 minutes of intermissions based. Um, most of it, I think, was that girl called Tiffany Culver, who a lot of people know, who I don't know. She was playing some tunes, going through the whole, you know, hip hop um, kind of work it um, vision sort of repertoire of songs which you know can get a little bit boring but you know it was fun at the time but you know it's not hmm how do I describe it it's not the most interesting stuff in the world because it's, it's the same I don't know 60 songs they all play again and again and again it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't change that's the thing that only angers me a little bit about stuff it's like come on man come with something harder again I know for sure if I was I know for sure if that was me and I was that situation, I just want to come a little bit harder with more interesting things. I guess maybe if you're um, the Drake's tour DJ, it's not really the opportunity for you then to kind of be a little bit more avant-garde. That isn't really the opportunity for you because, you know, I'm sure um, Drake's audience is quite, you know, generic in that respect. They just want to hear the hits. They don't want to hear your fucking B-sides or deep cuts and shit. But you can be a little bit more interesting in terms of stuff that you play. That's what I think anyway. But again, maybe I'm wrong in that respect. Um, the set went, um, he, she played pretty cool cool music i wasn't i wasn't too mad at it to be honest then um toy lanes came on he had a pretty awesome set too he did that annoying thing where he plays like 30 seconds or a minute tops of his famous tracks like you know opening verse a bit of the chorus then it cuts off opening verse but the chorus cuts off same same thing really hashed again and again that was a bit annoying but the one thing that was great about toy lanes was his singing ability i didn't know toy lanes could sing that well live he was amazing. He's got a re- he can really sing, like sing, sing for real. He's got a great voice. That was awesome to see him how he commanded that stage. And again, seeing him command that stage too was really good. He was, I, I think, I've seen a lot of videos of him performing at loads of kind of LA based shows. I think it might have been Coachella, it might have been um, Rolling Loud or one of those countries where he's kind of, you know, moshing and jumping into a crowd and jumping up the fucking, um, what you call it, um, traversing up the um, scaffolding and stuff. Like, he's just, he goes a bit nuts to these shows as well. He's always been quite a good live performer, but see him live again, a different experience. Um, not as small as I thought he'd be on stage. He's a lot bigger than like, he looks on camera. He looks very small on camera, but not that small in real life. Then we had a really long intermission, and then Drake comes out. Um, and, you know, the crowd is fucking electric, to say the least. Um, there's a cube, that rectangular cube happens, a curtain descends over it. Usually everyone's kind of walking through the down the runway that kind of links to the rectangular cube. But this time Drake kind of pops up from the bottom, which was fucking awesome. See him pop up and ah, started screaming. See him right next to you was quite weird. Um, again, I'm not a starstruck kind of dude, but this, basically we were, we were standing right at the back of the square. So he got to see him a lot because he kept walking back and forth to pick up a bit of his drink that he had. So you got to see him a lot. So it's quite weird to see him like up 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 close in person. Very a buff dude, um, really big, a lot bigger than he looks like on camera. Again, I mean, just saying this because I know I don't really see these guys in real life. So if it comes across a bit cringy, I don't care. My podcast say what I want. Um, 
So we see him play for a bit. He starts off very slow. I think eight out of ten cats and a few other things. I think he mi- he mixed up the playlist a little bit from the stuff I've seen him play in other shows. And then um, the biggest news of the whole event, his whole show, was that he brought out Jay Huss. He brought out Jay Huss, bro. Like it was fucking awesome, man. Like, um, and again, I just think it's real. I get a little ch- chills talking about it now, but I think it's a real testament to just how far the UK scene has come, right? That Drake, one of the biggest stars of the, in the world, right? The biggest star in the world, bar, bar none, right? Somebody that has re- very much so embraced the UK culture, somebody who's really popular in London, who's really popular in the UK by and large. People really like him, right? In general, right? He's not like um, one of those American artists that comes over and people kind of despise. He kind of, people really appreciate him, right? He, you know, he's about of the people he connects. He, you know, he's what he's involved in Top Boy. Um, he goes shopping and shit at the shops that we go shopping in in London. He hangs out with the guys that we like here in London that we appreciate. He appreciate the music. He's always putting some of the lyrics and passes his caption and stuff on some, you know, off key cuts of stuff that he, you know, he's actually watching on Gram Day and all that sort of stuff. So he's a good, cool dude. Big fan. We all love him. But it's real testament to how far the UK scene has come that Drake brings out Jay Huss and the reception from the crowd is insane. They probably screamed louder than they did when Drake came out initially. And that just goes to show just how big of a... Because I think in, the, in years gone by, a big UK person, a big US person bringing out a UK artist wouldn't be that popular because most of the UK people wouldn't even know that artist who they were, especially the people that weren't white. Especially the people that weren't black, sorry. They would have no idea who that person was. Like, oh, okay, cool, whatever, right? But everyone in that crowd knew who he was. So much at the end of the performance when we were, when we kind of, um, when Drake kind of closed out, I heard a couple of lads kind of say, oh my God, man, like, wow, j House is out. j House is back on road. Like, fuck, that's awesome. Like, people were still talking about how amazing that situation was. And even Drake had acknowledged it, like, yeah, that was special, wasn't it? And it was because supposedly the story goes that he got released from prison, I think, the day before or that on that same day. Um, and if you guys are aware that, you know, he went to prison for a, for a bit, I just think just under a year because he was unfortunately caught um carrying a knife when he was shopping around Westfield the whole story goes that he was in danger like you know he was feeling threatened of his life and it kind of tied in with the whole you know knife crime thing that was happening at the time and him being a big star he kind of had to suffer the consequence of carrying that and he was made a bit of an example by and large and it kind of came just at the time when he was his style was really starting to ascend he dropped his album people were really impressed by him and it kind of just you know kind of stopped his momentum but um you kind of always felt as if like people were really had a lot of good sentiment towards him anyway. Jay Huss is someone that people always liked and were kind of looking forward to him to get out. And I remember, I think I actually had the, I think I actually was thinking about it the other day because I randomly started listening to Western, Into You, Into, sorry. And I remember listening, thinking, oh yeah, shit, one of the guys is in prison that was in it. And I think, oh, he should be out soon, right? If he does, I always think, you know, most people should be out if they do half their sentence. I think he got four years, something along the lines of that. So he's already maybe done already two. So he should be out soon. And then immediately after thinking about the dude from Western, I thought about Jay Huss. I'm like, oh, he should be out soon too. And it was just a weird coincidence that when I go to the Drake show, we see Jay Huss in person. And I think he does a couple of tracks and just smack. No, he just does one. I think he has one. One in four, all, all the way through. And that's what he smashes it. Like, just a really good performance. And he, he looked genuinely happy. He looked genuinely ecstatic, like, genuinely. And I think it's a big deal because I think, by and large, the music industry is fickle as fuck. The fans are fickle. The industry is fickle. Your peers are fickle. So you're not you're within your rights to be a little bit nervous when you go into prison and you're a person like Jay Huss who's kind of you know starting to gain traction, starting to become popular, starting to become famous, starting to become well known for your music. You're allowed to feel a little bit scared. Oh shit! I'm not gonna come back and have anything to um to kind of call my own right when I come back. Um, people are not going to want to talk to talk about me or remember who I am anymore, right? You're well within your rights to think that because, you know, the music industry is fickle as fuck. So to have somebody like Drake of Drake's stature to come up, um, come to London, embrace you the way he did and allow you to come on his stage at the fucking O2, right? Sold out show Friday night and perform. That's fucking insane. And that's something that isn't, that's something that people don't do normally. And again, it's, it's one of those selfless acts that I think by and large, um should um let me go here to put here i think by and large that's something that should kind of um um that's something that by and large should get you how do you how do you say it that's something by and large that should allow drake to have good graces forever by and large because i think he's um 
the, the the amount of good stuff that he does for people, even if you even if you might be a dick, might be hard to work with, him, it'd be those good things should, should always outweigh the bad. I think so, in my opinion. Because who else does that? What, what person of Drake's stature is gonna come to UK, be have their finger on the pulse, and allow someone like a Drake, uh, someone like a Jay Hudson, be on their stage? Because you have to be of the streets, you have to be of the people, you have to know what's going on to even know who Jay Hudson is, to even know what impact he has in the UK music, to even know why he's so important to even have the idea the wherewithal to have him part of the show it's just a fucking amazing experience i think a lot of people have got it on video oh the video thing ah that was super annoying bad people were fucking recording at that show um they were they didn't stop recording there were cameras fucking flashing every single minute of the day i put a couple of videos up on my instagram just because you know wanted to flex some motherfuckers and show them i was at the show but by and large man just sit there and enjoy your fucking show you don't need to be always talking about it on social but anyway um, JS was there. Got, there's a little video here that somebody uploaded. I'll quickly go upload here and, and see if you guys can see. Let's quickly, let's just um, fast forward this a little bit. There you go. Let's see. Look at this. Look at this. So if anybody's sitting down right now, I need you to stand up. Because we're about to celebrate one of our brothers tonight. I think some people thought it was gigs and then look what happens. <laughs> Look at this, the talent, crazy. No one knew it was him. And then it starts like, everyone's like, oh, hold on, it's actually Jay Hart. It's like, it's so cool, man. The embrace is so real as well. Like, look at this, so nice, man. Look at this, so amazing, no? He's from Newham as well. It's just a fucking amazing, amazing story, man. Do you know what I mean? Like, not, not that great as in Newham, but you know what I mean, man. It's, it's adjacent. I mean, Jubilee Land, a couple of stops, man. But yeah, fucking awesome. This came for real as well. So cool. So cool, man. So fucking cool. So fucking cool. Fresh home. Hey, look, hey, look. What a fucking flex to come out and, and, and match his feet. HMP, right? And, I give you this and then to fucking roll up to fucking the O2 and perform on a stage of drink. What a flex and a half. You see what I am? Oh, so good, man. Yeah, yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh, uh. Such a big tune. But again, Jay House is absolutely amazing. I think so you guys can hear it on the on the podcast. Um he, he was smashing it. He came out, did his whole tune, and everyone was super, super, super happy to have him there. Um and yeah, I just think it was awesome. Great show. Um at the end we kind of stayed for a couple of more hours couple of more hours in a blue room to kind of let the kind of crowd die down and go on a train to come home um that didn't really work because it was still busy you know it's drake man like everyone's ha hanging around just having fun um ha everyone's hanging around having fun i sound like jordan woods in it we're just in, in young in la and just having fun you know um just having fun that was that was when the, we're gonna look back at that interview and just marvel in it, at the kind of la-ness of that interview jordan woods what a top girl um when we left i think a lot of people had gone to the all bar one just around the corner um, for the O2, just basically at the front, right, right, right at the front of the entrance, that was fucking rammed. But there's no way in hell that I'm going to an all bar one on a Friday night. Like you have to, you have to pay me a lot of money to do that sort of shit. So I didn't go to the all bar one, but everyone had a lot. Everyone looked like they were having their biggest time out in ever. Um, and I have to admit, man, the outfits are quite nice. I've got a bit of people there. The outfits are quite nice. A lot of roadman styles that I wouldn't probably wear, but I appreciate it. I like when it's done really well, you know, like heavy on the designer, incredibly tight, small t-shirts, tiny jeans, big trainers, you know, impeccable haircuts, jewelry. I quite like it, man. It's not for me, but I like the look. I like when it's done pretty well. I like the girls too when they have that kind of, you know, fashion over, 40 look. Um, 40 luxury thoughts, right? Not, not, not like, you know, obscene and being too crazy, but, you know, done in the right way, you know skin out in the right section you know trying to look hot and sexy and stuff i like what i saw i think it looked incredible big fan of it um everyone by and large had quite good style everyone by and large was very nice very very 
um, warm and loving experience. Drake, even towards the end, was like, yeah, this is what we need to see, more unity. He was like, oh, some tap someone to left and right, told them how much you love them and nice to meet them. All that, so that was quite nice as well, nice touch. And by the end, we left and it was a good night. And like I said before, like... I don't necessarily get to see too many A-list celebrities or A-list stars perform. You know, usually I, can, I you know, I'm a not not because I'm a not because I'm a hipster or anything, just because you know, just availability. I tend to just see the people that are mostly on the come up, um, let's say kind of indie acts or people that are on the rise, right? So when when you get to see top billing top performers, it's good to go see them because you just get to see the gap you get to see why they are paid the big bucks you get to see why they're the ones everyone thinks are the best in the industry by and large and um yeah just the fact that he was able to go through so many of his old tracks there's a bit in the middle where he kind of ran through mad cuts from mixtapes for 30 seconds 40 minutes 40 seconds 50 seconds seconds that was fucking awesome he played loads of stuff that i didn't expect him to play and just in general just a fucking good show man i was really big big fan of it um again maybe ticket prices are a little bit too expensive 100 quid to see drake play in that kind of place maybe a little bit too much considering the fact that you know maybe the only person on the uh, that was opening up for him that he went to see was Tory Lanez and maybe back on the nice hasn't got that much of a um, of a reputation in the UK just yet or internationally maybe if he had another person on the lineup that was a little bit more well known it might make it worth it but by and large I liked him as a one of things I don't really get to see people that often he was saying at the end of the show that he wants to come to back to England again next year instead of having two year gaps wants to come back again come back every year so you know once a year see a big person play spend 100 quid i get the same like seeing beyonce or seeing jay-z all those kind of people play i think it's well worth it in that regard but yeah good show um great production and yeah i think it's gonna ha- it's carrying on i think this week i think the last show maybe is on wednesday or something like so if you have a chance to go see him i, re- I guarantee I-, I recommend that you do anyway um moving on in moving on up what else happened oh yeah and then on saturday i went to go play at the heathcote and staff my night called labatees which is fucking awesome one of my best sets again in a while um and i can okay how can i say why was my best set why was my best set um it was a good set by and large because i tried to i tried to go i tried to play um what did i try to do the the initial plan was i was gonna go and take my um i had i bought loads of usb cables i bought a usb hub and i've got and i was gonna go and try and do hid mode um with my laptop and um, play that way but unfortunately it didn't work and hid mode is a mode that you can basically use your the cdjs in the club as a controller you basically plug in your you basically plug the your computer into the back of the cdjs um you plug your computer into a pioneer dgm 900 and up or something because they usually got a little cable at the top you can plug it into and you can basically essentially control everything through your um through your computer but it didn't work right and it didn't work and i was like fuck and i kind of thought it wouldn't work anyway that's why i put a pair of playlists on my on my uh, memory stick so when i went there i had my memory stick already set up i was like okay cool i can just play it from there and i think and again, I think I mentioned it a few times before, and I think um, there's an interview with um, Jeff Mills on Resonant Vibes that kind of touches it on it too. But there is something about having a limited amount of songs or having like a a, a playlist that kind of brings out the best in you when you're DJing. For me, anyway, I think personally, um, I think sometimes it, there can be it, there's an interesting middle ground because I think sometimes over preparing for sets, you can sometimes get a little bit um of you can get you can get a little bit a little bit flustered, a little bit like, oh shit, I don't know what to play. You get a little, a little bit over the place. Sometimes having just like a, a clear idea of what you want to play, like a clear, I don't know, let's say a hundred or so tracks, it really kind of focuses you in on what works, what doesn't work. Because there's, I'm sure in those hundred tracks are things that you've played before in other situations that you can kind of reference back to. There's things that you want to play that you're not sure if they're going to work, but you want to give them a go. It's just a good way to kind of really get yourself started. But I think sometimes having the... I know even when I play at the, um, at Tappies, when I'm playing this Friday for a night called Tapped, it's Friday 12th of February, for me, Friday 12th of um, April, February, Jesus Christ, imagine, you know, that, imagine, usually people say months ahead and I'm saying months behind. When I'm playing at Tapped, even if I'm playing my controller in a, in a pub, I tend to always have a playlist prepared anyway because I just want to make sure I have all my stuff with me, right? I know what I'm going to play and know what I want to do. So um, that went really fucking well, man. Like, I really enjoyed it. It was a really good time. Um... I played probably again one of my best sets. A very like again a different range. I did a thing that I kind of picked up from when I was playing at Dawson a couple of times recently, where I kind of you know I kind of made the mistake the first time I played there where I started off really slow, and this time round I kind of made a, I kind of made make sure that I played really fast. Oh, oh yeah, I kind of made sure that I played really really fast, right? 
I started off I started off like quickly. I didn't start off slow. I didn't go for the reggae. I didn't go for the jazz. I just came in quick with the disco, 120 BPM. Just kept pumping, 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 and then kind of pulled it down a bit. Like, you know, just pumping. Eh, hoping that the best sound low up. Yeah. And then kind of drew it back again as the night was ha- as the night was progressing and kind of slowed it down. And that kind of worked really well. People seemed really happy with it. And again, yeah, I think everyone had a good time. I stayed there quite long, went for a little after hours, then came back home. And then for the most of Sunday, ended up kind of recovering from that. And yeah, I had a really good time by and large. I think the Friday, Saturday DJ gig thing or, you know, Friday going out, Saturday DJ going out is a bit much maybe for me. In my, in my experience, I think I sometimes can get a little bit um, put off by it and sometimes maybe make you feel like, oh man, I shouldn't be doing this. I should be going home. I bet things I could be doing in my time. Um, but yeah, I think by and large being out and about, I think the Drake thing might have helped the way I played on that Saturday because I think... I had a different idea about what I wanted to hear when I'm out because I think, you know, again, not not a rib on Tiffany Culver, but, you know, there's no real difference to me from what she plays and what the stuff I've heard play at, you know, Living Proof, Work It and stuff. No, she probably comes from that same generation, same school again. I don't know the girl. I've never seen her in my life. Um, That's the first time I've kind of heard her play anything um of in translating to music in my life. I think I've maybe seen her name mentioned places, but I've never actually listened to a set. And by and large, it was the stuff I, you know, generally hear in the place that I used to go out back in the day. But I think listening to her kind of made me think, you know what, I'd love to have something different. And again, I don't know whether or not I'm even right because I don't know whether or not in those kind of scenarios or those kind of places that she plays and whether or not you just have to play that sort of stuff. There's no really getting around, getting away, getting, there's no way to get around it. Um, I think that's why maybe I probably prefer Pussy Palace as a place to go to to hear that kind of music. Again, maybe for some people it might not be their best place they want to go to because, you know, it's very, um, it's it very much leans on the queer LGBT, LGBTQ side of things, right? But I think by and large, if I want to hear hip hop, I'd definitely rather go there because I know I'm going to hear a more interesting mix of what hip hop is about as opposed to going to um, Living Proof or what one of their kind of nights. So it's just like the same old six or seven tunes. And again, it's just picking up on what the guys used to do back in the day. That's what that's the kind of problem I used to have with people that used to put on nights back in the day and not in your arts club and stuff. It's just the same shit. What didn't really change, and it wasn't really that interesting. But you know, again, not my business. Um, I would just do what I want. What I I would I would do what I I would do what I think is best and what I would like to hear, and then hopefully people would like to hear that too. And that was what happened. So yeah, that was it by large, and yeah. What else can we got? Let's move on to some subjects and topics that I picked out here, but you don't talk about. So number one, um, we should talk about maybe is the Supreme and John Paul Gaultier collection, right? That just dropped recently, huh? Do you, have you guys seen that? Do you guys care? Are you guys going to buy it? Let me see if I can put it up here. So they're typing in it wrong. But yeah, um, John Paul Gaultier Supreme Collection has um, preview has dropped. It's going to be coming, I think, this weekend, right? Because they always they they do a good job of doing that. Actually, they always kind of release a lookbook and then kind of have it available in the stores a couple of days later. So kind of the it's sort of like the ad the, the uh, Apple mantra, right? Um, Let's announce something, but then not announce the release date like TBC. Let's have it come up soon. Apart from the AirPod, no. Apart from the the wireless charging thing and the other thing that they had, what's that speaker they had where it hasn't come out yet, right? But most of the time, Apple are really good at kind of an uh, um, a- announcing something's coming out and then kind of announce the date straight after. So um, Supreme have done the same sort of thing and for the same sort of mode or modal modal. Um, with their kind of um, introduction with the John Paul Gaultier and Supreme collection. I'll try and get it up on here to kind of make it, to make it a big screen so everyone can see it by and large. Um, so the collection is here for you guys to see on the screen. If you're watching via podcast, if you're watching via YouTube, if you're not, then go on Supreme and check it for yourself, motherfuckers. But by and large, it looks pretty solid. Again, um, I think the, um, the, the trousers with... Um, Fuck racism on the, on on the t-shirt is probably not for me. Maybe a little bit, you know, a little bit too immature, a little bit too kiddie for my my liking. I do like the idea of the trucker jacket, the quintessential um supreme denim trucker jacket with the kind of um zip on the side that kind of reminds me of a leather jacket. That looks pretty cool, right? I, I quite like that. Um, I quite like this bomber jacket with a backpack on it. 
it's something again something that only a dude would want in their wardrobe i don't think any girl would actually want to wear something like this probably a bit ridiculous it might look a bit dumb having something in the back of your jacket anyway but i quite like the look of it, it reminds me of something it reminds me of something that head porter might do back in the day um head porter you know the quintessential japanese kind of you know accessories luggage uh baggage kind of company it reminds me of something that they would do but again it's really cool i quite like the trousers too the the kind of pinstripe right trousers with trousers with the combat pockets on the side they look fucking awesome um they continue on uh this jacket here this uh check kind of jacket pile i don't know what it is it's fucking awesome maybe my favorite piece in the whole collection the tracksuit i'm not really that big of a fan of i like the fact that madonna's daughter is um, modeling the gear you know a good little tie in the fact that madonna was you know the quintessential john paul gautier woman um this coat looks fucking banging in blue as well the trousers again not really a fan in my opinion maybe it might suit a girl better generally because it just doesn't look as corny on a dude the pinstripe double-breasted jack suit jacket is flipping incredible. I think the suit, by and large, looks really nice. Um, a little bit, you know, a little bit art school, but really cool, by and large. If for those of you that like that kind of thing, uh, the the waistcoat, the the jacket thing is probably maybe the better thing to wear with the suit in general. Maybe instead of wearing the jacket, you might want to wear the waistcoat uh, or the vest. The utility vest might look a little bit better as a suit together. This thing it look, looks fucking awesome. Whether this sort of harness thing is on top, that looks fucking incredible. That on a white t-shirt would just look insane. I can't wait to wear something like that at fucking Burkheim or something. That would look awesome with a white t-shirt tucked in with your boots. Would look fucking incredible. The vans, I'm not really a big fan of. The t-shirt looks pretty decent. And then the quintessential um, perfume. But yeah, this jacket is probably my favorite of the whole entire collection. It's called the Double Breasted pla Plaid Faux Fur Coat. It's fucking awesome. Maybe my favorite piece in there. Um, I probably, probably prefer it in the cream color colorway by and large the bomber jacket is fucking awesome with the backpack on the back of it it comes in a black um, silver and that kind of creamy color backpack as well the the trucker jacket again this is such a good little idea trucker jacket with the sort of like aviator with the you know is it aviator jacket with the leather jacket so the zip on the side of it so it kind of the shape kind of messes up a little bit again the fuck racism thing on the jeans i'm just not a fan of the jacket is really cool it's a little bit um fucked the proportion a little bit fucked up i think on purpose there um the pinstripe suit vest is fucking awesome the trousers are really nice i'm a big fan of it even with the combat pockets on the side of it you can wear it as a free piece isn't it right i wonder how much that would cost altogether as a free piece that looks fucking awesome no it's got the little um, drawing on the inside there too which looks really awesome um, and again i'd be cool to see if kids kind of go back into the archives and kind of really analyze john ball Kojie's work and kind of read up on his interviews and his philosophy on design and you know how his tie-ins with celebrities and stuff and avant-garde nature of it that'd be really cool his longevity in the industry is well something that needs to be spoken about a lot more it'd be cool if kids do it more often i'm sure they probably won't because they just want to buy the pieces and you know uh be the kid that has it first and whatever but it'd be cool if that did happen because I think there's a lot of room there for them to grow and for them to seek other designers that they're interested in. This shirt is really cool. It reminds me of something that Prada did a few seasons back or most of those printed shirts that people have been wearing. Um, I think this is going to be really popular. That's going to sell out like hotcakes. I think John Paul Gaultier and Supreme uh, Flower Power Rayon shirt. I'm sure that's going to be very popular with some of the kids. Like, you know, it's an easy buy for me in my opinion. Um, and this is one of my favorite pieces anyway. This leather holster is fucking insane. Really, really cool. Um, really really fucking cool very bdsm vibes to it um again just a big fan of it overall it just looks really really incredible i think that on a white t-shirt just looks so good even just with somebody that wants it to wear it topless that would look cool as well um the belt not really a big fan of the vans i was disappointed in to be completely honest the glasses i'm a big fan of um but by and large really solid collection um obviously the, the, the iconic john paul gochea perfume bottle is out there too so if you can you can check that out should be available this thursday right this thursday for you those of you listening now on tuesday for those of you listening in the future you've missed it you fucking missed it but yeah john Pogo chance supreme um coming out coming to you very soon again just another interesting collaboration isn't it like i think just when you think supreme have kind of run out of steam just when you think they're appealing to 17 year old kids in minnesota only who want to have supreme plus on the front of their shirt so um the hottest girl in chile they can kind of kiss them and shit like that they just throw this kind of curve like hey shut the fuck up and there's loads of things in there that i'd wear especially now as a as a mature supreme uh, fashion 
a supreme fan imagine calling yourself that that is in your twitter bio supreme uh, mature supreme m- mature supreme fan like ugh, disgusting but yeah that's out very soon so go and check that out for those of you that are interested those of you that care um what else is happening here that i want to talk about blah 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 what's up oh coachella is happening soon right um that's happening and i think i've just seen it here on hypebeast that coachella have announced let me get up here on the screen for you guys to see da, 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 da. can you see that there update youtube to live stream both coachella weekends and charles gabino and rihanna's guava island film cool so we heard about that a while back rihanna and charles gabino had made a film and now that film will be premiering on youtube um guava would like will be will be part will be bit will be will be part of this live stream from Coachella weekend. So it's going to be shown at Coachella. The speculation of the movie premiere started when Guava Island ad began to appear on Spotify. The ad speculated that the film will premiere Saturday night, April 13th. So Coachella's this weekend. Fucking hell. Is it this weekend, Coachella? Mama mia, I didn't know that. Coachella's this weekend. That is amazing. Um, is that, is that true? So when is... um? It's a stacked... It's a stay. Yeah, this is weekend, isn't it? Tw- this weekend and next weekend. It's a stacked um, festival time because Coachella's happening and then I think a couple of weeks after that is um, uh, Pharrell's thing in Virginia Beach, which is fucking insane. That lineup looks insane. Again, if I was in America, I'd be going to both things. In Sooner rather than later, America. Um, the article continued here. Other than uh, original story, YouTube expanding its Coachella streaming services to both of the... Festival weekends usually only does one for the first time ever. On top of being Coachella's exclusive live stream partner for the ninth year straight, YouTube has been upgraded to its festival official playlist partner. According to sources, this gives the streaming platform top authority on Coachella's website and app playlist embeds. Subscribers of YouTube Music and YouTube Premium in the US will be granted exclusive early access to early number limited number of tickets as the festival celebrates 20th anniversary. YouTube has oh wow, that's awesome, that's really cool. So if you're, you can get early tickets for your YouTube Premium. Again, that's to drive YouTube Premium subscriptions. I pay for YouTube Premium because I don't want ads. And also pay for it so I can watch YouTube in the background when I'm using my phone. That's a fucking great feature for me. As first of all, celebrates the 21st, 20th anniversary. YouTube has picked 34 performances spanning between two different weekends to see, including Billie Eilish, Blood on Rich, Charles Gambino, Mac DeMarco is always on there. It's always a good set. Pusha T, 1975, which should be sick. Weezer, new album come out as well. Wiz Khalifa and YG. Aside from presenting full sets, YouTube will also upload artists, vignettes, behind the scene clips as part of this 2019 offering. That is fucking awesome. So they're going to be official partners um, of Coachella um, YouTube, which is great as well. Again, I think I've mentioned previously, I think Coachella is probably one of my most favorite festivals out there that, again, I haven't been to just, just in terms of lineup, um, in terms of production. It's probably one of the favorite ones that they've done um, of recent years. I think we've seen, especially with Primavera in Europe, the amount of fucking cancellations Primavera has had. I think Cardi B is cancelled recently and a few other people. There's always people cancelling European tours because for the most part, people hate, hate people hate they hate coming here um juice world was just on breakfast club a minute ago talking about how much he hated coming to the uk because the food was horrendous again i can't blame the lad uh coming from the us and then coming here and then eating some of the shit that we have here was just insane so they don't like that the time difference the amount of time it takes to come here and i just think even though they get offered such big money to come here i just don't think it's worth their time by and large it's just not something that they kind of want to do again it's disappointing because you know you want these guys to come here more regularly because you know we're an english-speaking country they've got some of the biggest rabid fans that they would have out here but you know it's what it is but i guess what we're lucky at especially in europe we have quite a lot of we have a lot a lot a lot of very versatile artists that span loads of different genres that you know reside in and around europe that who, who are always hanging around and coming on tour so we, we kind of inundate the sport in that regard and then we got fucking glastonbury happening that's got you know one of the most eclectic lineups you're ever going to see if you ever go to a festival. So that's happening. But yeah, I'm happy to see Coachella being live streamed. I think I've watched it. Most years it's been on. I don't think I've missed one performance. Each year it's been on. So that's been quite cool. Um, Obviously, it's not as not as good as being there. But, you know, again, it's not you don't get to go to LA all the time. And, you know, Coachella is one of those things that you don't really... I don't necessarily plan Coachella to go to at all. By and large, um, I've kind of had the idea to go to. But yeah, I don't know. Some things you just don't really think you want to go most of the time to be like eh, it's there you know i can go if i want to i don't i'd rather go to, i'd rather go to la and hang out than go to la to go to to go to go to go coachella i push after going to gold point festival gold point festival is probably one of my funnest times i've had in a long time um but that was a special occasion because you know i've been a big odd future go for um 
you know, Tyler Creative, all that thing, fan from years back. So go and see those guys have a festival curated by them, by their team of rules. Probably one of the biggest pleasures or biggest, you know, um, satisfactions I've had in a long, long time. But yeah, Coachella is happening on YouTube. It's going to be a live stream both weekends, starting from this weekend, April 12th, uh, and then again next weekend, April 21st. So take that, check that out for those of you that are interested in Kit. Um, tired and continue on. What else is happening here? Travis Scott's got some ready made t shirts that are happening. That's really cool to see. What else I've got us here on? Da, 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 da. <laughs> Guest t shirt, Nike Shocks. I, do people like Nike Shocks? I don't know, man. These were always the shoes that I fucking hated back in school. All the all the breakdowns kids in my school used to wear Nike Shocks, and I used to fucking hate them so much. But a lot of people love them, right? Silver. I guess they've kind of slimmed them down a bit. They don't look as bulbous as they used to look back in the day, but I never used to go. I never got the hype of these shoes, man. Again, dancers in my school loved Nike shocks for some reason. They were just the quintessential dancer shoe, but everyone else was just like, you know, and I guess I think because at that time we always wear TNs, I think Nike shocks just look so disgusting compared to TNs and MX 98s and TLs and stuff. It just on 95, they just don't look good compared to them. I think when nowadays, because of the whole chunky train trend and shit, maybe they kind of come back in vogue. But I just don't know how you could seriously wear these with a straight face. Just not for me, dog. Not not for me. Um, hide up for now. What's happening here? And see if anything's happening on Dover Street. And I'm gonna kind of nip off now because I gotta get to work. What's happening here? Blah blah blah. Anything happening on Dover Street? Not really, for the most part. The shop. Nothing's happening there, is it? Nope, for the most part. Nah. Anyway, I think that might be a good place to end it. I think. Exit of Single Show episode number 175, as per usual. Thanks so much for hanging out with me and having a good time. I think that's been the most beneficial thing about this. Wow, man. This Kiko Costantin of Asics are 250 pounds. Fucking hell. Imagine running in 250 pound trainers. That is insane. Would you run in 250 pound trainers? No, I wouldn't. No fucking way. Anyway, no my business. This has been Action Zinger Show episode number 200, no, 175. Sorry. Thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, check out my website, actionzinger.com, for anything to regarding me. Um, link in the show description. And I'll see you guys again very soon tomorrow for another episode of the show. Peace!